my name is Matt. I uh, work at Soft Choice. Uh, if anybody isn't familiar with Soft Choice, uh, we located in Toronto, a Canadian company, um, and have an office right here in Vancouver. Uh, which is I'm based here. Uh, so anybody ever after the event or anything I raise here doesn't make sense. Good questions that you want to deep dive in with me. Uh, come here, work for is great.
slotted up there the fact that uh, on MSP Mentor, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with uh, their site, uh, MSP is around uh, managed services and helping people with their IT. Uh, we were ranked uh, this year as number seven out of, I think, uh, barely at least about 501 uh, uh, in the world, and, and that's worldwide as well. Uh, so we were ranked number seven, and then Talking Cloud in the top 100 were 38. So that's up against the Googles and the Microsofts and all those guys are in there as well. So we're number 38, which uh, I think is awesome. I love the fact that I'm working for a company that's uh, that dedicated to the cloud, uh, a company that's been around for so long. It's not a quick startup that came around yesterday, yet we're uh, innovative and uh, thoughtful enough to see where things are going. So let's get on with uh, talking about PHP in the cloud. Um, so a lot of the choices that you've got out there around the public cloud, um, just to raise your hands on this, uh, Amazon AWS, who's using Amazon, all right, that's probably everybody that put up their hand for uh, public cloud before, I would say. Uh, anybody using a mix, more than, more than one? So there's a lot of things to consider here. Um, I know PHP group here, and uh, it's all about the coding and putting that um, web bit out there, but there's a lot of pieces that tie to it. Uh, and there's a lot of things that you probably already uh, offload if, if you were doing private. If you're doing public, then you're probably already aware of these pieces that you can um, tap into. Uh, We've got the network layer, so whether you're tying that in, doing a hybrid between uh, the cloud and on-premise, uh, we've got that advantage there. Um, dedicated hardware as well, that's one misconception that a lot of people have about the public cloud. Uh, people think public means that, hey, I've got to share my hardware with everybody else. Not true. I think on Amazon, I think I worked it out one day, it's only like 20% extra in cost. Uh, so you're not looking at some sort of 500 markup or something to have your own dedicated hardware. Uh, granted, a lot of the clients I work with, it's more around uh, latency and uh, getting a guaranteed throughput uh, rather than any sort of security concerns or anything like that. But I do deal with a lot of clients around compliance and it does let them breathe easier at night. PCI compliance and that actually doesn't, uh, most of the time those sort of Your edge cache. So, uh, if you're if you're using someone someone else out there, you might be using something like uh, a third-party service like SolarFlares. Uh, you can actually tie that into Amazon or Azure um, and take advantage of theirs, which means also there's less of a jump between networks. Obviously, it's all within their network, so you can actually keep it all within the same house, uh, which means it's better for you. Load balancing, so this is something um, 
across a, uh, I was at a uh, Drupal user group uh, a couple of months ago, and this was one of the pain points that I actually found uh, was around load balancing and auto scaling uh, that traditional solutions didn't have an answer for out there. Uh, everything was in, in the traditional data center. Uh, one of the things that everybody just put up with, I felt like it was like this uh, elephant in the room that everybody had heard everything else going on in the public cloud but didn't want to jump onto it. Uh, they wanted to keep their own hardware, actually touch it. I've heard uh, people say, uh, you can't touch it, you don't own it. Um, I, personally, I think that goes out the window when you're, um, when you're actually trying to get ahead of everybody and uh, keep competitive and s s stay on that price point as well. Um, and also have that high availability that a lot of us had, well, years ago, we didn't even think of because we could only afford that one server to keep running. Uh, so load balancing and auto scaling, I think, is a brilliant thing about public cloud. The fact that, say, you've got a gambling site, say it's uh, uh, horse races, for instance, you can, you can have your, uh, your website automatically scale up for that one event per year.
can set up a network within 15 minutes, just a couple of uh, mouse clicks, and you've got a script that automatically does all these things. And I know in the developer space, we probably get a lot of flack for uh, uh, shortcutting things. And uh, I know uh, the operations team used to always make fun of me uh, wanting to bypass, and I'd always, we'd always come back with, oh, it must be the antivirus, it must be the firewall, it must be, just turn it all off and it'll work. And that's because we're in the development space. But the great thing I like is about cloud is we can work in those environments that are just like the um, production environment. So all you're doing is just changing the internet, the DNS entry, or something like that to come through to a live account. Uh, it's not like we're force lifting something over to a totally different environment to Cisco and expensive equipment that we couldn't afford for our test environment. Uh, it, Nine times out of ten, everything is almost identical. So we can do a proper test, and we're not, not upsetting the office team as uh, much as we did in the past. So I think that's an important thing to consider and understand, uh, especially since um, I think the days of everybody concentrating on patches for operating systems are starting to disappear. Everything's becoming uh, application-based with Docker and things like that. We're not worried about that. I think there's going to be a shift more, uh, well, it's already happening, uh, towards security for the applications instead of blaming the operating system and the network and the environment that it's sitting on. Uh, so I think that's an important, important thing to get around. So I just, um, I've stolen this from Amazon's website, uh, but it gives a good idea. I think it's a really good example for any web development, um, all the options out there that we've got. Uh, very generic here, uh, talking about um, we're looking after the, uh, the DNS and the, uh, the routing and the traffic here, coming through to a, a load balancer here, uh, which is going to distribute the traffic evenly between our web servers. Uh, then we're going to go on to a load balancer for our application servers. And then finally, here our databases at the back. Uh, the A and B here is interesting because uh, that's splitting the workloads between different data centers or regions. So you could have East Coast, West Coast, high availability. So when we uh, finally get our earthquake that's overdue here, uh, we'll be fine. We'll be laughing from our websites are all still running. Um, but, uh, and, and we've got lots of options there to tap into. And then uh, just over here, the cloud front for Amazon, which is uh, doing your caching uh, globally, uh, so that when somebody hits something generic, uh, such as what we've got stored in the S3 storage, uh, they hit that fast. So, and if anybody isn't aware already, there is, so Amazon's got their S3 storage, which is their bucket uh, file data storage, raw data. Uh, it is static. But if you've got anything static on your website, such as images or things like that, you can actually tap into that and use it for your websites. So not only are you saving your costs there um, and the high availability that comes with the 11.9s and uh, durability and all those sort of uh, technical bits, um, but you're also, uh, I find the traffic going into the S3 is uh, pretty phenomenal. Uh, compared to web servers where you've got a the virtual machines, you've got to make sure that you've got the right CPU there. You've got to make sure that you set up your auto scaling. If you've got raw files there that you're tapping into, you can just throw them in the S3, do a pointer to them, and not worry about the rest. So, in essence, although it looks like a lot's going on there, once you've got the architecture set up right, um, really a lot of it's automated, it's looking after itself. So I think a lot of the time now, uh, I spend a lot of time planning this out for clients. Uh, instead of us tacking things on later, uh, sometimes, especially with the networking layer, it's harder to shift the ship the ship later on. Um, but if, if you're architecting it right from day one, with the idea that, hey, this could grow big, um, then you're right, but you're still not spending that money that you would normally be expected to spend. If, if you walked into a traditional private cloud data center and said, right, I'm expecting a million hits a day, they're gonna say, well, we've gotta provision this up right now. But with the public cloud, all you have to do is just make 
sure the design is right, and it'll look after the rest of the stuff automatically. Uh, we've got that auto scaling and load balancing set up correctly. Does anybody have any questions about this? I've explained it perfectly, or? Uh... So just just a few references here around. Um, so I'm, I'm going to concentrate on this uh, slide with uh, AWS. As you can probably tell, it's probably my strength is the AWS area. Uh, it's what I've been doing for five years, uh, day in, day out, doing a lot of presentations about it as well. Um, there is on GitHub, if you can see that address there, um, there is a download there for the uh, SDK uh, for Amazon's uh, PHP tie-in. Um, and there's also a lot of guides out there and documentation. Um, so I just listed off here a few of the advantages I see with the SDK to PHP. So if you're using DynamoDB, um, there's a lot of tie-ins there that you can do with uh, session handlers. Um, so it's not just about the PHP bit, but how it's interfacing in with the database in the back end. Um, if you've got large uploads that people are doing, uh, we can use the SDK to do them as multi uh, part uploads, uh, so that if the upload drops off halfway through, you're not going to lose the whole whole thing. So, and that ties in with their S3 and their Glacier. Glacier is their uh, long-term archiving storage, one set per gig. Um, so, and then also the resource helpers. So, um, all about uh, managing your um, your requests and your uh, your transactions and resources that you've got happening in the back end. Uh, if you're using the SDK, Amazon's uh, SDK is going to manage all that for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about working out route robbers or timing or things like that. Um, it's, it's just going to manage that automatically for you in the back end. Um, and then just some, some things I've called out here is around Opsworks and Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, some things there that you can actually take advantage of to uh, automate a lot of your deployments or management or ongoing uh, escalation and uh, auto scaling around those things. Anybody have oh, yeah. Can you spin up instances with the uh, with PHP SDK? So, yes and no. I guess Amazon. Same question. Oh, sorry. Uh, Rob's asking uh, whether you can use the SDK to automatically spin up other VMs, other instances within Amazon. Um, so, yes you can, is the basic answer, uh, but it's not dependent totally on the SDK. Uh, obviously there's, uh, there's a lot there with JSON scripting that you can do around Amazon. That, that's why um, that makes it hard to clearly answer the question, but it's also Some things. 
So they've gone up on GitHub as well, their PHP SDK tie-in. Um, they also, Microsoft, do a very good job of documentations and guides. Um, and then uh, also, the two areas I find that they do a really good job of is uh, MySQL, MySQL, and the MongoDB. Um, I don't know whether that's just because people who are Microsoft orientated seem to go in that direction for their backend databases, uh, but that that is the, uh, the feeling that I get. It could also be because that is a target uh, areas that Azure is looking at uh, instead of falling too closely behind the other players. Um, and then um, we we're talking earlier about S3 storage on Amazon, which is the uh, file data. So Microsoft have got what they call blob storage. This came about when, um, I think it was about SharePoint 2007. Uh, they started using blob storage to get the storage outside of the SQL database. So it's basically raw data uh, back, back in those days. It's just raw data sitting there outside of the database. And the database would have a call for that raw data instead of it being embedded inside the SQL database, which as you know, if you've dealt with Microsoft SQL, it uh, does slow down things and becomes quite a pain as soon as it starts getting quite big. Um, so Microsoft actually have a, a lot of uh, different options around their blob storage now. They've got the S3 equivalent, which is their, uh, their raw data storage, but they've also got table services. Um, memory, I think there's about four or five different types of blob storages uh, that are specific around what workloads you actually want to do in there. So, so I find that this is a good way of like seeing the differences between the two. Amazon are just doing simple S3 storage. They have their, uh, their R-based storage, I think it's R2, I think. Uh, it's only two data centers, and then they've got their Glacier. But it's not around the workloads that you're doing, it's around uh, the cost and how much redundancy there is there. Hi, uh, I was wondering, have you actually uh, tried setting up your whole environment using HP SDKs by HP SDKs by Amazon or Azure? Like, so right from scratch, is there something, is there something there to be built? Yeah. I, I typically haven't. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess my, my knowledge is not, I mean, I come from a development background, university and all that, yeah. um, kind of shifted into the architecture area in the last five years. Um, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, people didn't hear, it's just about, uh, it's just asking about whether I personally uh, set up from scratch with the SDK. Um, most most clients that come to me have already something something happening and they're, they're wanting to uh, take advantage or move things over to Amazon. Yeah. So we're looking at the architecture, but then on top of that, we're saying, hey, you know, th there's these other things that you can take advantage of that are not going to change overnight either. They're, yeah. they're set in their ways, uh, just like an API that people are doing these days. So you know that you the rug's not going to be pulled under from you tomorrow when they shift everything again. Um, so in that regard, you, like any API, you take the advantage of something that gets yeah. reused and fine-tuned by many people, not just in your own little world there and having to rewrite things from scratch. Uh, but yeah, no, I haven't uh, done anything from scratch myself. Do you have any uh, experience working with Google Cloud Services? Yeah, so, so the question was uh, my experience around 
personally put anything up on the Google Cloud. I've done a lot of reading about it, um, but I couldn't give you any real world uh, scenarios or examples of what I've done. Uh, but from what I read, it sounds like they're following very closely with the basics. Um, their tie in with VMware's vCloud Air gave them that VM, like the VM stuff that they were missing. Also gave VMware the storage and the service. And so that's one thing that Google's doing well is the S3, the block storage, that sort of stuff very well. Um, they've also, uh, like I said before, they've got their app service where you can just throw your application code in and they'll look after the whole back end, the VMs and everything. You don't even have to worry about it. So that's something that's really good there. Hi, yeah, I, was, I was wondering, do you know if um, any of these two, um, I guess, Azure or AWS have analytics or dashboards built in? see if they had the analytics and insight. So Microsoft Azure does a really good job. Uh, you'll actually find not many third parties tying into Azure as you do AWS. I think because they do a really good job with the insight, the analytics, the dashboard, all looks very pretty. Um, nice little graphs and analytics that's going on there showing you the traffic and those sort of things. Amazon, uh, I guess because they got in there, so what they're really the pioneer of the whole public cloud I see. Um, and when you get in there that early, it's harder to change things later on. Um, and it's also the reason why I like Amazon a lot is because it's very raw, so I'm free to do what I like, um, which is also why there's such a large third-party community out there um, building Board 
So I'm going to talk about something called uh, option. So has anyone here written Scala or Haskell? Okay. So for the rest of you, this should be uh, should be interesting. Okay. So how many people have returned null from their functions? Yeah. Really? Some people haven't. For Sean, I know you have. Okay. So let's talk about an uh, imaginary example. So here I'm parsing a URL. So this should be passed in a URL. So there's a function that's going to take in a URL, it's going to parse it to a URL object with its host name, its scheme, HTTPS, HTTP, its path, all that stuff, right? But if, the, if we can't parse the URL because you know you passed in someone's name, that's not a URL, then we're going to return null because hey, we can parse it. And then we here we have a function here, which we pass in this URL, this, this object here, and then we call get host on it. Okay, so what happens if parse URL returns null, and then we pass it into host name and try to call get host on it. So you know, you know it's fine, and then, yeah. So it's not good, right? It just blows up in our face. Okay, so, so what's the, what about, your, what about type hinting, right? So that's nice, now we have strong typing in PHP. So, you know, now we can say, this host name guy says, hey, I'm never gonna call get host on null, because if you pass null into my function, then it's gonna blow up. Okay, but people can still pass null into your function at runtime, right? So in this case, what happens? Yeah, you're still screwed. It's still gonna blow up. You're gonna get an exception saying, hey, null is not a type expected URL. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we call parse URL and we check, hey, is this null? And if it's not if it's not null, then we can call hostname. Otherwise, we can set hostname to null. Okay, so what's the problem with this? You forget. Is null function? Sorry? Is null, you can use is null, not equal to null. Yeah, it's the same thing. You notice I'm, I'm just doing a, I'm doing a strict comparison here. Um, so we can document, you know, that hey, this, you, this function returns null, so like if you didn't check it, it's your own fault. You know, hands off. Um, you'll notice this is PHP storm. Here, this can return null or URL, but PHP storm doesn't warn you. You know, it doesn't tell you, hey, by the way, hostname expects the URL, don't pass null into it. So there's something called an option, and there's this in like Scala, and basically what option is, it's a box. And inside option, there's either a value, or there's nothing. So what we do here is, say we manage to parse the URL correctly. If we parse it correctly, and we get a, a new URL object back, then we put it inside this option box, and we call it a sum. So it's a sum of URL. And if we don't put anything in there, it's called a none, but they're both um, they're both parent class is option. And then if we want to get at this thing in the box, we call map on it here. And inside the map, we pass the function, and that function operates on URLs. So the function doesn't have to worry about the fact that it's operating on an option. It just operates on the URL object itself. And then if, if option is a none, then this function just never gets run. And it returns a none. So basically you think of option as a box, and inside it is going to be a value or not a value. So okay, what's the difference between an option and a null, right? So, so here's how we can calculate in Scala. So that parse URL function takes in a URL, but instead of returning a URL or a null, it's returning an option of a URL. So it's in the type signature. And then if we parse the URL correctly, it's going to return a sum, and if it's not a URL, it's going to return a none. So that was just that previous slide. So here's how we use it. So we parse the URL, and then we call map on it, and in, we pass in a function. This is just Scala syntax for a function. We pass in a function that knows how to deal with URL. And the cool thing is, is that if, if there is no URL from the original function, this parse URL, it's just gonna return a none. It's never gonna run that map function. It's never gonna blow up in production. It's never gonna show a terrible message to your users. And Scala has an additional thing because it's compiled where like, it won't even let you compile, it won't even let you pass um, parse URL, which can return an option into hostname. As we saw in PHP, it totally lets you do this and then in production it blows up. So that's a nice idea of Scala, but still, you're forcing your, your, your um, caller to deal with the option. So they, they can't just act like it's not gonna happen. They have to specifically say, okay, I know I'm dealing with something that could be none, let me, let me deal with it. So there's actually the same thing in PHP. It's a library, it's really small. It's called PHP option, and here's how you use it. So you try to parse the URL, and if it was false, if it if it if it if it's a legitimate URL, if it's an LFPHP, so 
FYI, the harsh URL returns false if the URL is parse, not null. So this argument returns false. I don't know why. So anyway, so if it returns false, then it couldn't parse the URL. Then we're going to create the sum. Right? Remember, sum is an option, and we're going to pass the URL into it. So it's a box, and it's got a URL inside of it. If it doesn't work, we're just going to turn it down. Okay. So whatever. What's the point? Well, that's the point. So that's your ID here that's telling you expected URL got PHP option. So right there, you're coding. You're going to notice, oh crap! I forgot that this function could return null. Now the nice thing about PHP is you can code an awesome application in a day because you don't really care about null. But the problem with that is if you ever deploy to production, it's going to blow up on your users. So that's really nice. Um, so then this is how you would use it. So you'd call parse URL and instead of returning URL or null, it's going to return an option of URL. And then if you want to get at the URL inside of it, you just call map on it, and then you can uh, pass in a function to use it. So takeaways: document everything because this isn't going to work for you throughout your code base. Um, I can get into that later. This lightning talk, so I don't have to talk about all the bad things. I just talk about the good things and keep going. And uh, even better, force your callers to handle errors, otherwise they're going to forget. How many people have forgotten to handle a null and had an issue in production because of it? Yeah, like it, it just happens, right? Or like an array value is not set. You get those stupid errors. Okay. So let's, I just want to go through some more like kind of things that are cool about this. So before, say this find some entity could return. It's like in your database or whatever. It returns null or it returns a thing. So if it returns null, you want to throw an exception. Otherwise, you just want to you know use it. So you can take all that boilerplate and you can just do this instead. So this now returns an option, and you call it get on that option. And if the option isn't there, it's going to throw this exception for you. Otherwise, it's going to return it. So that's really nice. Look, we got like one, two, three, four, five lines down to one. I guess you just inline everything. But okay, what about say um, say this finds an entity used to return a used to return an exception. And you used to cast that reception, and then you instantiate a new entity. Instead, what you can do is you can call find some entity, and it's either going to return it with this get or else function. It's going to get it, or it's going to return a new entity. So you pass in what else it returns. So you're just like you're just killing all the boilerplate. Another one. So you find some entity used to return null, and if it returns null, you want it to just return a new entity. So instead, what we do here, it's the same thing. Get or else, we return a new entity. So this kind of uh, this option library can really cut down on your boilerplate. I like that part about it. It lets cut down on boilerplate, and I also like the fact that it forces you to handle all the error states in your code. So this is a library created by Schmidt Joe, who's like a pretty big PHP guy. He wrote a ton of Symfony stuff, and uh, it's a legitimate library. And uh, oh, sorry, you want to take a picture of that? Go for it. Any questions about it? For Sean? How do you deal with scalar values? Scalar values. So you can put scalar values into it. Oh, so you always return an object and every function always returns an object? Yeah. Okay. So I mean the thing is is it's it, it I wouldn't say like you should use it throughout your whole code base because it, it doesn't work that great. Like it's kind of it's kind of useful in small areas, like in your own API that you're controlling your library or whatever, and it's really nice for that. But it, it, it can like kind of metastasize through your code base, and because the way PHP works with like closures aren't really nice to write, you have to do function, and like you can't pass class closures. It's it's kind of not great to use everywhere. If you look at a Scala code base, it's used everywhere. But that's because it, it, the language provides uh, functionality for it. But I think it's really still really useful. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Uh, have you seen how Swift deals with null? Have I seen how Swift deals with null? No. So uh, I guess since I'm up here, uh, so thanks a lot for coming, guys. 
Uh, I want to give a big thanks to Hootsuite for hosting, uh, Telegram for providing all the beer and pizza. That's awesome. Uh, Oro with the cloud credits. So meetups15 is the, uh, the promo code. So if you sign up there, you get $250 of free cloud hosting in Canada, um, which is nice. So um, we're going to think about maybe changing up this meetup a little bit. And uh, we kind of got some ideas about different ways we can make it more useful to the community. Um, so we think, we're thinking about maybe doing uh, some, some groups where you like hack on different frameworks and we kind of get people who are experts at Laravel and Symfony and Cake and all that stuff to come in and you know if you want to learn about that framework we can hack on it. So uh, I've got some nods to the front here, that's a good idea. So uh, yeah, stay tuned, uh, maybe we'll send a survey or something to figure out what we want to do with it. But thanks a lot for coming. Now, uh, last question, is there anybody, who put your hands up if you're interested in going for drinks after so we have an idea how many people are at them. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, cool. So Matt's gonna be there. If you want to talk about cloud, because like you know, there's a ton about cloud. That'd be awesome. Um, for everyone else, uh, please put your drinks in the back. There's a uh, there's recycling on the right, the left, and the back there, and uh, washing them to the back. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for coming.